go to Rowley's. Yeah, I think that's the wrong thing. I need to pick out which one well, someone else saying the same thing means. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Morgan. The bulls are not as structurally sound or as fit as some of these heifers are for us to hear. Across the board, it's a little bit more. At least all mine got big balls. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Look you at might, the you might, like, that. You, might, you might not like something, but I, I promise you, I'll be strong. Check out the nuts the on that. Oh That's not yours. <laughs> Bridger, is it going? Yeah, it works. Yeah, whenever you're ready. That's my book. Don't go off the book. No, I thought so. I never. I thought I'd screw it down. We, we're no, not. Yeah. Nobody's precious <laughs> sweetheart seems like Bridger. You don't want to hurt sweetheart. anybody's feelings. What? Sweetheart. 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 How long can you hold the door? Right. Okay, ladies. Do we need to do the next group? No. I don't think so. I don't think there's anybody different here. Yeah. And we lost a few people. They probably bored them to death. Okay, this is this the round table? This is the round table. We're at the round table. We are at the round table. Well, are, are we round tabling or are we criticizing bulls? Criticizing. <laughs> Evaluating, you meant. Criticizing. <laughs> We're multitasking. <laughs> We're multitasking. Interesting. I've heard dairy guys talk about how they can go behind a heifer and see how many little folds of her tiny little udder between her thighs and that that gives them a sense for potential size of udder like, you know, Jersey men or something. But I'm not tell. I'm not sure that you can do that with ours. Um, you just want to make sure she's got the parts, yeah. but uh, you won't know until the first lactation really what you got. Absolutely, Amen. yeah. That's, it's a, a yep. definite factor. Yeah. And, and I mean, the truth is, before we're going to look at a, some slides of bulls, without question, 100% of the time, if you, you've got to like the mother of that bull because he will make daughters that look <coughs> like his mother. It's, do you think that that can't be true in every case? But I swear the it longer I do it, the more I realize it's that's true. the truth. So, oh, that er, every bull should be selected on the base of what his mother looks like, because that's the character. Those are the characteristics you're going to see in, in his, his daughters, in his females, with very little variation. If you don't like his mother, you're not going to like don't, his daughters. Don't use him, even though he's all shiny and beautiful. If if you didn't like his mother, if you get a chance to see her, or she's got some serious serious flaws or crappy udder or something, you really think twice about using him, nice as he looks in that moment. I always make bull selections, always, based on the strength of their mother, always. And I don't, the other factors, yes, they're important, but if he doesn't have the very best mother that he could possibly have, you better not use him in the first place, because you will be disappointed. It'll, just, it'll bite you. But that's how you would, in, if, if you knew that you had some issues in your females that you wish they milked better or that they were better doers in your conditions or whatever, when you go get your next bull, try and see what his mother looks like. And if she, it looks like an improvement for you, then use him. Even if his horns aren't huge, if his mother was a good cow and, and had all these features you like and big horns, he's still worth using because he'll, he'll benefit you in those areas you're deficient, or you hope you will.
there's a bull. Okay. <laughs> I, it'd be nice to know how old he is. Exactly. Uh, because he looks like he's probably around a, a year. How? Eighteen months. Ooh. Oh, okay. He doesn't. He he's not enough of a bull. No, Dustin. Um, in my opinion, comparing him to how I look at my young bulls, and I'm really hard on my young bulls. He's not bully enough. He's not masculine enough. His scrotum isn't big enough. His body isn't deep enough. That's it for the bulls. He I'm looks strong. Trying to get that. <laughs> I'm trying to get Yeah, him. the old Hello. shrinkage, the shrinkage <laughs> argument. <laughs> yes. Right. Hello. Yeah, there's two things on there immediately I don't like about him. Testicles. One yeah. and two. <laughs> yes. They're not big enough. Not mature enough. That's not to say that he isn't able to make calves, but this is the problem is that we can we we accept that because he can make some calves, he will breed your heifers or your cows, but but it's not optimum. And without a doubt, in animal science, there is a testicles in bulls directly correlate to the ovary quality in his daughter. It's they they know that very well, which is why the beef breeds put such emphasis on scrotal circumference because um, large testicles are associated with large, productive, early maturing ovaries in the daughters. Small testicles are associated with poor productive, slow maturing uh, uh, ovaries <laughs> in the daughters, just like a straight line. So if you know you already don't have that, that higher production and you breed, you're passing that on. So it's just, it, it's kind of going to snowball on you. History repeats. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they hang. They hang the same. I mean, we're talking about bulls. Do you want to? Yeah. No, it's important. Sounds like one didn't fully drop. In this picture, you can't really see it there, but look at his nose there. Does it look like it's just so crooked? Really and crooked. It, up here, it's probably harder to see, but uh, um, it looks like it's got a little bit of a twist to it. I'm looking at the photograph, so it's a lot more clear, but it, it looks like he's actually got a little bit of a twisted nose. Um, and I certainly would want. got a little bit of navel that I don't like. He's got some skin under his neck. He's got a twisted muzzle. He's got a real small scrotal circumference. Um, he doesn't have an overabundance of color. He probably will get more color as he ages. Um, for 18 months, he doesn't have above average amount of horn. I mean, there's there aren't any things about him to me that are just spectacular. Um, he does not appeal to me at all. But no matter what he looked like, let, let's say he, he had all the positive features in a bull you wanted, his scrotal circumference would be enough for me to pass on him, period. I don't care how much horns on his head, I don't care how correct his conformation is, and I don't care how wild his color is. He ain't got the scrotal circumference. That's what makes him a bull. And guess what? He's lacking on the one thing that should be at the top of the list to make him a bull. He doesn't have that. He has all those other things. You know what? He'll make a gorgeous trophy bull. I mean, that's brutal, but that's just a fact. You can't fool around on a bull. You're putting his genetics into your entire herd. Can't fool around with that. And I'd want to know what his mother looked like. And if she wasn't an outstanding cow, he doesn't deserve to be.
doesn't have a lot of body depth. He's he's kind of like a sausage body, and I think, and so it, he's it just isn't enough animal for for what we're looking for in a in a bull. But you know, there's bull calves that'll be born, and the first two weeks he looks like a bull, and I pray as I watch him, I pray that everything comes together, that this super masculine baby has the horn that I want has the testicle size that I want, you know, that develops because I can already identify that hormonally he's programmed to be a bull because he walks like a bull, he talks like a bull, he looks like a bull at two weeks old. And then there's some that never do. I guarantee this one looked like the heifers when he was born. But some of them are slower to mature mm -hmm. and the horns are slower to come. And, and I do think sometimes if we judge them, a little too harshly, it, and it really depends on what your goal is. You know, if you want a huge 12-month horn measurement or a huge 24-horn uh, month horn measurement, if that's your goal, then yes, you probably want your bull to have gigantic horns at an early age. But I've had some good experience with bulls that were a little slower on their horn growth to begin with. But in the end, you would be very, very pleased. They start slow. And some of those genetics just do, and then they take off. And then they pass those that were the early matures because they jumped out there and then they stopped. These come on later. Once they start, then they just keep on going. So the horn is a whole different thing. And, and a lot of times people pull the trigger too quick on the horn because they think the bull's not going to have enough. You've got to study your genetics there to know if that's a family that has earlier or later maturing horns. Um, and, and I know better. I've sold some heifers that I didn't think were going to make it in my program and drove by and saw them three years later and stopped and begged the man to sell them back to me. And he said, oh, my grandchildren love them. We could never sell them. And I'm like, but look at them. <laughs> They've got all that beautiful, twisty, gorgeous horn, you know. I pulled the trigger too quick because I I knew better, but it's like you can't keep them all. And I'm like, well, they're behind everybody else. And, and the same thing with bulls. You know, sometimes they're a little slower coming. So if you know your genetics and you trust them and you like everything else about them, sometimes it's worth waiting just to see. He, to me, he doesn't give me a, a vibe that any of that's going to come together. Well, it's back to picking a heifer to, um, to be a purity heifer. In my mind, she's, she's a potential brood cow. Every bull, when I judge him, I'm looking at him like he's going to be a potential herd sire. So you've got to look at the factors you would look at if you were evaluating him to, to go into your program at, to, to breed animals. That's the way I look at them. I don't look at them as show animals. I look at them for their breeding potential and what that animal can bring to the table, what he can do for your program. That's just me. I'm, I'm looking at it as a breeder, not from just a, strictly a show. I, I want it to be total package. And that means attractive to look at, functional, and can go into your program and do what you need to do, not just be pretty in the show. I think one of the problems that we have in this industry, speaking of, of longhorn people, potential longhorn breeders, because that's your goal, you want to be a breeder, you don't want to be a cow trader, is we've got to get out of the mindset that we look from the shoulders forward to see what the horn is. That's the first thing I hear out of a lot of people that have gone to a sale or gone private treaty, but just look at the horn. Okay, but look at the testicles. What's he going to produce for you? He may, he may have... 90 inches of horn when he hits two years old, but look at his testicles. I mean, that he's not going to be a good breeder for you. Cut those babies off and stick him out and let people admire him as trophy steer. But we, even with cattle, um, with cows, you've got to quit the mindset of looking from the shoulders forward first. Does she have an udder? Can she raise a baby for you? Is she, is she built correctly that she can deliver a viable calf? 
this this is hindsight here. This is after the fact that you've, you've looked at everything else because if she can't raise the baby for you and if, if he can't give you good heifers to, to be in your breeding program, you don't need him regardless of what he's got on his head. Let's move along. Oh, okay. If we, you, there you go. Do y'all see what I see or you don't see? It's hard to tell from that. You're looking at the actual photo. Are his testicles twisted? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Hard shout, it's hard to see there in shadow. It, it looks, looks like they are, but I don't know if that I outside the side is turned. Right. The side view doesn't see. look like it should look on his testicle, the shape, but yeah. you can't really tell why that is. Yeah. If it's just the shape or just but if he's the angle. Similar in age to the other one that these aren't bigger than the, the other one. How old is this cat? So about the same yeah. as the mm -hmm. other? Okay. I Did I do that? Turn that off. <laughs> oh, you're fine. I would I would need a much better photograph. Yeah, that's we hard. Get them to judge. Yeah, that's really hard to judge this guy. You can't see what's underneath him now. Uh, uh oh. Hmm. That's a more that's a, a more of a prospect, I think. Again, it's hard to judge his parts on this photo, but uh, he looks a little. Old. Is he a little older? Justin, or about the same? Yeah. Hard right, to know. it's hard to know. Is he cresting already? <coughs> you want to be fair to him. So yeah. <laughs> Which guy would that be? <laughs> I never touched it. <laughs> are you trying to raise the volume here? No, ma'am. If you guys are... We're not doing a thing. We haven't done anything any differently. Yeah, I don't know. Are some of these animals, they were poor photos taken on purpose, and could be scraped so they're easier to see? Uh, some of the heifers, they were a bit more difficult to see. So as I was going through, Ooh. Okay, so there's a flaw. So we don't have to be gentle. No, I, 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 <laughs> okay. I think you guys to be harsh. Oh, to be harsh. Oh, wow. I love his color pattern. <laughs> Julie, do you want to pay attention to the fact that there's a bull out in the back of the Okay, that's a really interesting question because I think there's some pelvic differences between cows and bulls just by biology and I think that the fish hook thing seems classically with the female pelvis and a little less so with the male and I'm not sure I, I'm not sure how you view that as a uh, in evaluating them what do you think Nancy well I don't think you, you want it to be so I think um, it's, it's not quite so it's not. Hi, but you want a. But you don't want. You want it to be pleasing. You you don't yeah. want it to. He has a little. Draw your attention to it. He has a little. Yeah, I guess you want to see that his tail comes out of, <coughs> in approximately the same location, but it may not have that up and over right. look. Exaggerated. I would be concerned about whether that's a shoulder, or his neck or some weakness there in his back. You see where that immediate dip down is there, where the white spot comes. You may not get right in there. There's like a hump up there, and you can't really tell from this picture if it's his shoulders or if he's got some hump started on his neck and then that drops down from there. It's hard to tell from the picture. Um, if, if he were a full profile shot to us and he were looking straight ahead and we were looking at his side profile, 
I think we could answer that question. But I think that would be something that would bear further investigation on him to see if that is, and is really an issue. development right. doesn't look like it's quite there either. Yeah. It doesn't. But these hard are young to know. Guys. Yeah, yeah. Young. it's hard on them. Is that the end? Really? <laughs> I have a better picture really? of him. <laughs> so he has a fish hooked to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's much. He does look like he has significantly more testicular development, though. They look a little fuller, don't they? They do. And it's hard to see in that picture. I can see it here in this photograph. It's in the shadow, but but they are definitely bigger, bigger around, and appear to be symmetrical. I think if you trim the excess hair too underneath, right. it's gonna. I think he's probably pretty tight there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he doesn't look like he has a lot of sheath. It's mm -hmm. just just. Did you, talk about it Did you say were we? Will you or talk will about we? his bone structure? Go ahead, Mary. Do you know how old he is? He's my bull. I don't know what the age Do you know how old he is? <laughs> well, what Your would bull? he have been here? <laughs> He's my bull. Um, and he does have he can move this. Um, what would he be? This was June? When yeah, was this? So roughly. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, I think you know, he is going to be a medium-sized bull. This is um, a big wig son out of some old traditional lines. So he's, I, I didn't, I wouldn't imagine that he would be, he's never going to be a one-ton bull. Mm -hmm. But then he isn't bred to be a one-ton bull. Right. He's probably going to be your 1,500-pound bull, which no matter what anyone says, is pretty much breed typical for our bulls. Mm -hmm. Pushing one ton, I'm not sure a lot of them have the structure to, for longevity, but that's another conversation. So I, I think he's medium medium bow. Okay, so you mentioned the whole bone structure. Whatever one thing. I mean, can you look at a young bull not knowing truly about the size of the bone structure and what they're gonna be eating? I think if you look at ten of them you can. I think if you look at ten bull calves of different of various lines you'll be able to, to make an assessment. Him standing alone is going to be harder. Sure. I just happen to know this calf, so I know that he's going to be in the medium frame category. And, um, but that's, that, I think that's what our breed is for the most part. there's a certain balance it's it's an eyeball thing it's also a correct thing big boned and um and mushy tendons you know big bone with mushy looking joints and and not that tight clean look it's same in horses bone does you no good if the soft tissue around it is doesn't have integrity so i think you, you have to look at the whole package i think it's a, it's an overall balance thing and you want to see you know those tight clean mm -hmm. well-defined tendons into the hocks and around the ankles and um, you know that that has that sense of, of integrity and durability It is all over. There's it is. You're lots, right. <laughs> lots of different families, and um, and I think there's something good. Of, I think there's something interesting in keeping the diversity of type, as long as they're functional. I think I think that's kind of interesting. If they, do we want them all to be identical? And that's the one thing I worry about the futurity thing. 
is that we all have a certain image of what a futurity and we, we're sort of driving them towards a, a singular type. The more we do that, the more we're going to do that. And that's a beautiful animal. The, a futurity one is usually a gorgeous animal. But, but if we select on that basis only, then we're going to start unifying the breed and we might lose some interesting things. And you can look at the variations, but if you say it's just a size thing and you're not looking at the complete animal, maybe it's you have to look at if at that size they still have the body that they need, the structure the horn, then you're okay. But if it's one thing specific or if they are just that, you know, very that small or that large and that's all they have, then you have a problem. Well, they're going to fall down. Yeah, they're going to there's their legs over time. I mean, you can see that. You, yeah, I've, you have a lot of deterioration. Yeah, you can see a deterioration. You can see the joint angles start to sag. Mm -hmm. um, you, and, and another th place that you'll see it is you'll start to see the hooves become distorted because the whole column above is not straight. It's starting to put uh, extra stress on, on the growing hoof parts that, that have to change their shape to... to Mm -hmm. compensate. So um, I don't think in any livestock, in, in any creature uh, that, that has to walk for a living, I think you, you have to focus on the integrity of the soft tissue. Now, in a beef steer that's going to die at 18 months, if his joints are crappy, and he, it, who, uh, why would you use that as a selection criteria? And I mm -hmm. think, you know, he just has to stay upright long enough to eat and walk into the truck. Yeah. But we want ours to, um, you know, mine her out in sagebrush and rocks and potentially on, you know, as a, boy, yours cover some ground. Yeah. You better yeah. have a big leg. I mean, yeah. I think mine covering 500 acres have to be pretty good, but yours, yours well, really we, cover some ground. I mean, th we did this with trophy steers, but after our, um, we brought them up from one, one area of the ranch to the other to, to do the measuring and all that stuff, and we... Um, Waited till it cooled down so that we could get them back. They were walking seven miles to where they needed to go. And this is seven miles. We have kind of some rolly areas, some creek beds and stuff they have to get through. So, you know, yeah, we definitely have to have that, that integrity in, in their joints and their structure, be able to get. And that's, that's just one specific thing. They had a lane they were going through. But we do have some areas where it's big brush country. And... You know they've got they've got to be able to get through the brush to get to their water or whatever they're doing. The the other thing you have to remember is that chronic pain, low level arthritic <coughs> pain, um, uh, directly impacts fertility. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, um, the cows cows will struggle to to be fertile if they're always in low level pain. So you have to assume that just like for us, wear and tear on joints, um, uh, you know, accumulates over a lifetime, and it's the same for them. So why not start out with an optimum or as close to optimum, give them a, a run at a long life and a pain free life, and um, so. It's like a long distance runner. He doesn't have good legs under him. He's not going to go very far. And that chronic pain will cause a debilitating breakdown. Yeah. We got another one. Yeah. He, look, he looks really young. Do you know how old this one is, Justin? Nine months. Okay. No, he's a little older than that, I think, Justin. But a little older. Not, not really. Kind of like construction on that guy. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah, you can't. It's so black with the shadows. Yeah. Yeah. Black's a hard color to judge yeah. in a <coughs> photograph. Does he treat the horse too? <laughs> he's, a, he's a baby, yeah, isn't he? I think this is another one of those where the, the head shot is, yeah. is out of proportion. It makes his head look big and, and his rear end look small. Yes. Although he, he does look like he might get a little lighter in the, yeah. in the hind quarters. But, but it is kind of a bad angle. <coughs> he wouldn't be even a year here. He'd be uh, you know, like nine months. Probably. I don't know what to tell you. It's, you know, this one's got bigger bone potential than the other one that we were looking at that Roni one, um, and in, I'm assuming is going to be a, t a little bit taller, thicker animal when everything's done. So if you That's a really good question. It's almost like you have to look into a crystal ball. Um, but lanky, it doesn't imply leg light leg bone them, no. to me. Yeah. Um, they can be lanky and thick, yeah. thick bone mm -hmm. like at the cannons, you know, just big circumference there. So again, it comes back to balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I think of lanky, maybe for me, it's not necessarily a, a negative judgment. It just means that he doesn't have a lot of meat covering that, you know, like a a, a 14 year old boy who's six foot tall may not have the m muscle growth yet, but it it'll be there. But for right now, he's lanky. Yeah, like yeah and I don't I don't see lank, lanky to me is not a bad word. It's mm -hmm. just a it's just a descriptor for that stage. It, to yeah. me, it means the muscling does not match the frame. Yeah. In other words, he may have the frame, but his muscling is not there to make him rounder or more filled out. Versus, looking. you know, light or right. weedy or something. And um, Yeah, I know. They almost kind of mature a little right. quick in horses, early. and I'm not sure if we could make the same judgment in, in young bulls. That's a strategy bulls. on that, mm -hmm. on late maturing. Um, you know, if he's <laughs> huge <laughs> body down, little <laughs> short legs because he's only 14 like months old or something, that that doesn't look right. So maybe you do want to see a teenage gr a teenage period where they're kind of kind of growing and. and mm -hmm. And and that and you can look forward to a big body down the road.
Yeah, my Jamaicanism son was like that. And Jamaicanism is known to Jamaicanism was a good sized bull, and he tends to throw, you know, good good big frames in his off progeny. Mm -hmm. And he was that that was a lanky bull. He was he just didn't have a lot of meat covering that big frame. But in the end, he ended up just 30 pounds shy of a ton at full growth. So it came. But people who knew the bloodline better than me told me that's wait, normal. Wait. Just wait. You know, there were, it, but having said that, the animal was correct. Everything was where it was supposed to be. Um, so lanky wasn't a, wasn't a word for defective. That was just <coughs> a stage of development. I think the world theory actually has science behind it. So I have seen that in horses, and I look at it in the in the cattle too. Symmetry in develop worlds are an indicator of symmetrical neurological development and endocrine development uh, in utero. So that's why um, so that's why it actually is useful to look at. Um, asymmetric worlds tend to be associated with some perhaps some sort of asymmetry in in early development. I don't think they know all the details, but it, it does have some science because Temple Grandin talks about that in some of her later research. Um, I don't think anyone here would uh, would say that temperament wasn't one of the number one things you got to look at in bulls. Um, and I think bulls can throw a bad temperament to their offspring as much as a cow can. So it's pretty important. And of course, they're bigger, they're fast, they can be lethal weapons. So they better be, uh, better have good temperament. Well, yeah, environment definitely takes yeah. factors. It never, nothing's 100% in genetics, so that that could very well be. But but don't keep a bull, no matter how good he looks. It doesn't do you or the breed any good to keep one that uh, there's that there's any risk to beyond the norm of just livestock. It's not worth it. There's too many good bulls out there. And you can start judging temperament right right away, right at, at weaning. I I know Daryl Dickinson, when Joel was around, and I don't know that he's here, but I mean, I know Daryl has a whole scheme of judging character and weight and weaning weights and growth, but I know they judge temperament right out of the gate on, on the bulls in their program, and I try and do that too. You know, they, they get a chance. They get a couple chances, but... Um, if they strike out and show a bad temper in the early handling, they don't get a whole lot more than one or two chances. What's why? Why bother? Mm -hmm. Why keep them? I agree. Yeah. Yeah, because that's when you're with them. That's when you get knocked down in the alley. Um, Let's, Tom, yeah. Tom Curtin is actually. Tom Tom actually does a clinic. Oh, that's true. That's his. Yeah.
taking things and using them and care, effort, food, everything. They'll get loaded two to three times a day three days a week for three months. And I walk outside and I can go out there and start prayer line looking at snakes and I go, I don't need to walk that way. There's no reason why I'm not going. He took that safety kids and pull them off their homes when they're two, three months old and put them in the tent for five or ten minutes to separate them. <coughs> We've done some things where we'll run cattle through the chute but not really do anything with them. So they're not always associating it with that I'm getting an ear tag or I'm getting branded or any of that. So just so that they know it's okay that I'm coming in the chute. And then you've got, it, sooner or later, you've got those cows that they'll go in and, you know, we've got the squeeze. They're going to come in, put, put their horns where they need to, and then just kind of ease over so we don't have to work with them as hard as we normally do. When you're working with, the whole herd, especially on, on the size that we have, we need to be able to get through the whole herd in a day if, if that's what we're doing. Ex Experience moving those cattle help too. And I can't tell you how many times we'll be moving all of our cattle from the back part of our place to the front part of our place. Then all of a sudden I've got three people standing there going, oh, I want to help that have never, ever, ever been around a cow. And so you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but at the same time, I don't need that person getting in the way of what we're doing. And so I just have to say uh, thank you, but no thank you, because I, number one, I don't need you to get run over, and you're going to because you're going to step right in front of her or him. And the other thing is you're going to get kicked because you're going to run up on him on the backside or you're going to hit him with a mule or whatever. So, I, you know get people that know what they're doing. If you need help, get somebody that has been around cattle. I think his points are, tr are, excellent. are excellent. And I think we all could benefit from um, learning better cattle handling skills. And But if I'm looking at a group of 10 bull calves and nine of them work in our system that they grew up in, that they're familiar with, that they worked with their mothers, in, and I have one that, you know, shows uh, extreme uh, volatility in his reactions and stuff. And the uh, the other nine are, are open to learning. I don't I don't knock them if they're ignorant in that system, but but at least they're or a little uh, you know a little nervous Excited. or whatever. But if I compare the whole group, and I've got one there that has a harder time learning, a real hard time learning, then I'm, I'm going to really consider calling him simply because as a, operating on the group, the, the others 
go with the system, are, are open to, to changes, don't overreact. Um, I'm not sure that a lot of us have the time to, to or the uh, more actually the education to know how to operate the ones that are on the edge. That's all. And the thing is, a lot of us sell cattle to people who are either extremely new to cattle or have no facilities or are no real cattle handling background. And I feel an obligation to try and, and keep the group, um, you know, keep it as safe for everybody as possible. But having said that, I would appreciate understanding better yeah. how to operate the cattle. And of course, it'll benefit them. You need to give them a chance. We're going to wrap up here in just a minute. If anybody's got related questions of what we're talking about or anything else that's on your mind, this would be a good time if you want to bring those forward and then we'll have some discussion and we'll wrap up. Sir? It is all over the board. I think it has a lot to do with your climate. And I like to wean um, – no earlier than six months, but sometimes it's later than that because if we have a an extended hot spell, <coughs> and I don't want to stress the calves by weaning them when the weather is over 100 degrees and high humidity. In our area, the humidity is what's so dangerous because you'll get respiratory issues in a heartbeat when it's real hot and humid. And in those cases, if they're doing fine in the pasture with their mothers and there's grass, um, I'd rather leave them another 30, even 60 days on their mother if the mother's not showing any um, wear and tear, you know, if they're not pulling her body condition down. So it just depends. Weather has a lot to do with it in my situation, but I would say probably six to eight months. We usually wean at seven, about seven months. Average seven for me, too. That's about the same for us. How long do you wean? Hmm? Mm -hmm. How long do you wean? How long? Oh, we use the nose, nose tags. Those work awesome. I really recommend that. You have to have facilities to be able to bring them in at least two times to put the, the tags on them, but that's a really, really low stress way to wean. And um, you have to bring them in to put the tags put on, and then Again, the seven, down. ten days later, bring them in to take them off. Now, the nice thing is um, I can do their final weaning vaccinations when I put them on, give them multi men and whatever their second set of. Uh, of vaccines and then a week later, 10 days later, take it off and, and separate them physically from the mother. But so that's, I really recommend that. It helps. Yeah, they barely make a sound. It helps. Now there's always cheaters. You'll always have a cheat. Right. You'll have about 10% cheater calves right. who, who get around. They figure out how to nurse with that nose flap in. Yeah. So then you you end up having to, when you finally do wean it, there's a little more drama between mom and baby. But <laughs> but 90% of them go with the system. And it's old cows with long tits. Yeah, the same. Cows can do it. That projects an incredible image. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I've, I've, I've been doing it for about 
five, six years now, and um, we have, knock on wood, we have no respiratory, no no train wrecks at weaning. Those Gals calves are, yeah, either. go Gals. right on to feed or right into yes. the, the, I keep them in a weaning pen where I can feed them the best hay I got and be real close to them so they, they gentle down. And um, I, I got to say, I got to make a pitch for those uh, quiet weans. No, 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 no. Get it's your just quiet wean. Get the quiet, quiet wean. wean. Ones. Yeah, they're plastic. They it's just, just clip in you there. just tw you just twist them slightly and you can fit them in. Got a ball on the end of it. Yeah. They make some that have spikes that would poke your the cow in the udder, which I don't know why anyone oh. would ever want that. Mm -hmm. But these are just plastic. They have no spikes on them. You just clip them in and then take them out. And you can reuse them year after year after year. You'll you, you'll lose a few, a couple will break, whatever, so you always have some extra. They're like $2.50 a piece, but and they're reusable. They work great. Yep, I use them, and I like them. No. Quiet. They're called quiet weans. They're made in Canada. They're, the brand is quiet weans. They're smooth. They're not meant to they punish have, the cow or the calf. They don't have spikes on them. They block the normal, the right. calf's nose going up to grab the teat. It blocks that. They can graze. They can eat, drink. They just can't nurse. So do they get up under the cow and start banging they, that udder? Look, it is, it is really, it's really funny. funny. It is funny because after a day or so, you know, they're, because they're still with their mother with that thing on, right. and they want to nurse, and she wants them to nurse. And so they're looking at her like, what's the problem? And she's looking at the calf like, what's the problem? But they're together. Yeah. And so over a period of seven to ten days, they've stayed together. The calf can't nurse. She dries up. She dries up dry or begins up. to dry up, and then you take the calf away, take the nose flap out, and put them in the weaning pen. So now they're just separated, but because they've not been nursing, you reduce that anxiety of walking, hollering, bellering, carrying on. It, it is an amazing process, and it's so simple. I wish I had thought of it to invent it, but <laughs> it, it really does work well. It really and you're does. you're calling it Quiet Wean? Quiet Wean's the brand name for these particular tags. That's right, exactly. But it really does reduce the stress on the cow and the calf. But, but the second day is like the pen of hurt feelings. Right. Everybody's Everybody. feelings are hurt. Right. There's right. Nothing's working right. Yeah. The they don't understand the cow yeah. or the calf, either one. They're like, what? what's the problem? Yeah. What? I weaned my, my main herd get weaned uh, end of November or uh, beginning of November, and I keep them in through the winter. Um, and then they go back out on grass because we don't have grass at that point. So they stay in on, on my best hay with some liquid supplement over the winter, and then they go back out on grass in April. Mm -hmm. They, they, they ride right back, back nursing. nursing. Yeah. I don't ever I don't separate. Mm -hmm. separate them. Just like you would if you had weaned them. I don't ever put my weaned calves back until they're, I mean, I might as a, three-year-old or something if I put that heifer back into that herd, but I don't ever put my weaned calves back in the pasture where the main cows are. Mm -hmm. And, and yep. Theo, we don't use that, but it's, we have the numbers-wise, it's just not cost-effective cost right. effective for us. But what we have found, um, we kind of put, put in a babysitter. When we wean, we put them in our pen. We've got some young steers that we're working up to our trophy herd, so we've kind of put them in there. Our bull calves right now are in a pen with Big Red. He's a big steer, um, but he's where he's got uh, gotten up in age. But he's able to tell them, you know, hey, here's the feed bunk if you need something. It's just kind of that guidance from a, another calf that's in there. Um, and then the heifers, we've got the space. We kind of put them in a place where we forget about them for a little bit, so that we're not seeing some of these awkward stages. We know they happen. And we do see them at times, but um, that's the fortunate way that we do have the land that we can kind of put them in a little hidden area until we're ready to, to see what they're going to do and what their, our, our breeding plans are for them. Quiet, Quiet wean. wean. Quiet wean. Yeah. And they have a website and they have... They do in Valley Vet. 
And Valley, Valley Vet, Vet sells, sells them. them. And yeah, it's a lower stress. The point of this is they've they've done university testing with cortisol levels for stress and that kind of thing, and they've they show you in with with their studies how much it does reduce the stress, and because the stress is reduced, their immune system stays strong through the weaning process, and so you have healthy calves or or much more healthy calves. Yeah. I do that. I do that. Anybody else got anything? Thank you, ladies, very much. Welcome. Welcome. Are you appropriately?